I always find it interesting when I do these that I feel like at times you're on a couch and you're psychoanalyzing yourself. When you're just doing your career, when you're living your life, you're not thinking about it that much. Over time, all of a sudden you look back and you go, wow, I guess there was an impact. It's always interesting people then going, well, walk us through how you got there. Uh, probably most people will tell you it's not, it's not as well planned out as you may think. From Spider-Man illustrator to image comics entrepreneur to action figure impresario, Todd McFarlane became the most successful comic book creator ever by constantly asking one simple question. Why can't this look cooler? This is his blueprint. During college, you're drawing literally in a trailer trying to perfect your skill set from 10 o'clock till two in the morning or whatever it was. What exactly does that involve? I bought comic books at 16 and I was smitten by the style, right? I, I, up to that point, I'd never bought comic books. And I went, wow. So I had been the incessant doodler since I was five, the, the classic best artist in the class kid. I, I was always that kid. There was no focus. It was just random doodling in probably a hundred different styles. And then when I saw the comic books, I went, I'm gonna teach myself this. So I, I fell in love with comic books. I bought them by the hordes and I just started doing it. The process was this simple. For a week, I would just draw the forearm. That's all I did. I wasn't trying to draw Superman. I was just trying to draw his forearm. The next week, I would do hands. It was almost a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to learn anatomy one piece at a time so that I could become semi-functional at it so that at some point, you could start twisting the body and moving it around and doing all the things that make comic books interesting. So for me, when I was in college, there's two things I used to draw. A, some of the classic superhero, the Supermans and the Batmans and the Spider-Mans and, and the X-Men was popular back then. But the ones that I used to draw just equally as much were the characters that were the unknowns because they were the books that I thought I had a legitimate chance for. You're never gonna replace the all-star who you may replace is the one that's on the bubble, the bubble athlete, right? Mm -hmm. So I there, there are lots of books that I would open up in college and going, wow, I like, the eyes look crooked to me, the anatomy was, I go, I, I can draw crooked eyes and bad anatomy. So why don't <laughs> I draw that character and send it to that editor? And maybe he might go, yeah, he's just as bad as this other guy and give me a chance. And, and after two and a half years of doing that, over 700 samples, over 300 rejections. And at some point people should have been asking Todd, at what point were you gonna actually stop being delusional? How many knows before it's real that the answer is you're not really good. But I was determined after 300 that I was like, I'll show them all. I just ended up getting a job because I deluded every editor at every company every month and I think they just called uncle. We keep getting 10, 20 of these packages every month from this kid. Would somebody here, would one editor give him a job so we get one package from this kid instead of 20? And I think I just wore him out. I think from a distance, I wore him out. There's a certain amount of, you know, meticulousness and tenacity that it takes. Delusion and immaturity. You could, those are fine lines. Okay. Let me just say, those are fine lines. But but where's that coming from? I don't know. I'm, I, I'm just taught. I, <laughs> I, I don't really sort of analyze myself against anybody else. Some of the stuff that I've gotten credit for in my career, I don't know why they're giving me credit for it because anybody else could have done it decades earlier. Spider-Man, when you came on, was very much still stuck in the sort of John Romita mold of the 1970s. You came and you made Peter look, you know, contemporary. You made Mary Jane look contemporary. Right. Every artist before me for the previous 20 years could have. I was just going, hey, it's 1990. Let's make it look like it's 1990. <gasps> oh my gosh, Todd, you're a genius, right? <laughs> what, for making it look like today? Okay, I'll take the street cred, but I don't get it. Let's give you an example. Steve Jobs, right? He took everything that pre-existed and he made it sexier and he made it prettier and he made it sort of fun to be with. What did the iPhone do? It dialed, every other phone did, right? It took text, every other phone did. He goes, yeah, but when you text and you write, you don't touch buttons, you touch the glass. <gasps> oh my gosh! And that was it, that was his genius. He put sexy into it. So now I do those moves. And all of a sudden, I don't invent anything new, I just put sexy in it. And, and you get a lot of credit. So 
I got to a point where I didn't really care if the editors got mad at me, and they were. They wanted me to stop everything. Why? Because it was their status quo. He was everywhere. He was their stamp. And then here comes this little Canadian kid, and he starts messing with it. And I was in multiple meetings with the editor-in-chief, and they pointed fingers at me more than once saying, stop it. Stop it. Stop making his eyes so big on Spider-Man. Stop making his costume so dark. Stop putting him out jumping out of panels. Then he goes, stop that spaghetti webbing, right? And it was, it was a glowing moment because I, I didn't have a name at that point. I went, wow, cool. He just, in his anger, gave me the name of something <laughs> that he doesn't want me to do. 88, you do Batman uh, year one, those covers. And, and all of a sudden... And the Hulk, there, Hulk was starting and about the, that and the, and the Hulk. And the, there's a huge shift there. And you, you see the capes get bigger and flowier and more dynamic looking. People start popping out of uh, the panels. My degree is in graphic design, right? My college mm -hmm. degree. So I was applying some of that onto the pages. Why? Because I knew I was an average to below average artist. So if you look at those early Infinity, I was just getting you to look at sort of this glitchy stuff, the paneling layout, hoping you weren't actually looking at the drawings <laughs> and going, he's not very good, he's not very good. And I was hoping that over time, I would then get better and I wouldn't have to rely on the glitz. And then when I get over to Marvel, they were in this period where they're going, we don't want any glitz. And they go, can you just do like a grid page that's basically two, two, and two? So what I needed to show them was, can I handle a deadline? Let me just tell any person who ever wants to break into our industry, deadlines are goal number one. So if you're mediocre and you can hit deadlines, you will have a long career. And so to me, I was trying to show them that I could draw fast. So I go, sure, I'll make it boring, but I'll do it fast. And they were going, wow, he's not the best kid here but he's quick and he's got a little bit that's something there. And then once they gave me the job and they weren't looking, I started then pushing back and bringing in some of the glitz and doing this and doing this and doing this. And it was some of the stuff that eventually got me in trouble on Spider-Man. By the time I ended up getting into that meeting with the editor in chief for the fifth time, you know, I was able to just go, Tom, you hired me for one goal to sell comic books. That's what your business is. You sell comic books. I sell more comic books than anybody you employ. Why are we having this conversation? What do you care what it looks like? What they were doing is they were taking a personal affront that because I was changing their status quo, I must have been doing it because I thought what they were doing was wrong. Never, that would never cross my mind ever. I was doing it because I, want, I needed to do something different to survive as a young artist. And I was doing it different because being an artist or a novelist or whatever, it's a lonely occupation. And if you can't get through 12 hours a day with what it is your work is, you're gonna drive yourself insane. So who was I entertaining every day? I gotta tell you, me. So <laughs> I was going, well, wouldn't it be cool if Spider-Man looked like this? Wouldn't it be cool if Batman's cape looked like this? And I was lucky enough that there was enough people out in, in the world that had the same attitude going, yeah, that does look cool, Todd. And so they were buying into my style. What is your financial aspiration for this career as a, as a comic book artist? What are you thinking is the sky, you know, the limit? 80,000. That was it. That was, I drew, I drew a line in the sand and I go, if, if I ever make $80,000, I will never ask or want for more. Just so everybody's clear. I'm in business for only one, one reason, to drive my art, to drive my ideas. And really what it takes isn't the idea. Lots of people have great ideas. It's the money and the time and the gumption to do it. And so I taught myself business as a second language. I consider myself to be bilingual. I'm an artist and I can talk business. So you want to put me in with bankers? I'm good. I'm good. I can talk their language. They think I'm actually a businessman who's, an, who's a quasi artist. Here's the driving point. You can either go, I want to get in business because I want to make a million dollars. And I've met plenty of those people. I think they reverse engineer. They go, I want to be rich. What do I got to do? Oh, I got to come up with a good idea. What's my good idea? I think it's wrong. Come up with a good idea. Do the thing that you like. Put it out there. And if it is of quality and people like it, the byproduct is cash. And, and, and you get into it that way. Here's why the business matters. Because if I can maintain a certain level of success, not because I care all that much, 
but it allows me to walk into rooms and pitch more ideas and ask for their ideas so that I can use them in my toys because I, I, I'll use their movie ideas and bring them in or their video games or their TV show and bring them in. And there's only one way they're going to say yes to any of it. What you have to be able to do is walk in there and say, look it, here's what happened on the last three things we did. Boom, boom, boom. Do you think that the same momentum will be here? If you do, let's go. And they make these quick calculuses and they go, Todd, sit down, let's have a talk. And I go, good, I got them where I want, which is I get to now talk about art. And as long as I have a certain level of business success, they will allow me to get up every day and do art. And that's the victory. In half a decade, McFarlane had become the most popular artist the genre had ever seen. But rather than stay in pocket, he bet on himself and went independent, launching his own imprint, Image Comics, and his own character, Spawn. This is our very first meeting of Image Comics as an official company. And we all walked in and we talked about what books we were going to then publish. I walked in the door saying, hey, there's this character called Spawn I did when I was 16 and I want to pull him out and here's sort of all the pieces I've got. Has anybody got anything to add to it? So that's it. 25 years ago, that was the start of it right there. In 1992, you've had an incredibly successful run on uh, Amazing. You get to the end of this and you decide that you want to go out on your own and completely disrupt the industry. That comes from a place of wanting control, not a place of feeling undercompensated. It's, I, I started running around trying to ask people if they wanted to start a union. I was Norma Ray. My attitude was if we, can st if we stop drawing, they got nothing to sell. So we have power. So what ended up happening is I talked to a couple of people who then in the future become my partners. The seven of us accounted for 44 of the top 50 selling books of 1991 out of 8,000 books that were printed. We did 44 of the top 50. That's who was leaving. We were, we were some of the elite guys at that point. We didn't go there to negotiate, to demand anything. We just went to say, we're leaving, here's why. And oh, by the way, if it was us, I'd do something about it, because how do you know you're not gonna get another seven creative people next week and the week after and the week after? And then we went over to DC. We just basically gave them the same conversation. We're not here to work for you either. We just thought it was worth repeating because you guys have a bunch of creative people. And we left and that was it. That was the beginning of it. In those first two or three years, were there behind the scenes machinations made by these big players to try to negatively affect the success of Image? Yes. Like what kind of stuff? We would hire some of the kids to do books and then Marvel would come along and go, hey, how would you like to draw Iron Man for us? So they would pick off our roster and go. And then they just cash whipped a couple of my partners. So all of a sudden, a couple of the founders of Image are doing work at M uh, Marvel. I, I probably have had, just myself and my studio, 20 people who I found off the streets, gave them a big chance. And then Marvel came along in a year or two and went and, and took them. I don't put anybody under contract. Right? So I was like, if you don't want to be working for me, I don't want to force you to work for me. And Marvel and DC got into this place where they started putting everybody under contract because they didn't want them coming back to some of the independents, especially to us. What gave you the feeling of security that you felt like, you know what, like financially, I'm in a place, right. my career wise, I'm in a place, I can just, I can walk away from the biggest company in the space and I have no plan. All right, here's the math. Out of 100% of the Spider-Man pie, or any Marvel comic book pie, we were getting 4%. Okay, so, so okay, 4%. So that meant that we could now sell 1 25th the amount of books. 1 25th. But since we were getting 100% of the 1 25th, it would equal financially the same 4%. So we could get killed in sales and it not take any kind of a hit financially, and we had total creative freedom, that's a win. And guess what happened? It didn't go from here to 125th. It went from here and it actually went up. It went up and we got 100% of it. How long did it take the seven of you artists to hammer out the business terms of this sort of cooperative that you had created? Oh, the, six seconds. Here's how it works. <laughs> Image Comic Books in 1992 and Image Comic Books in the year 2017, right, don't, doesn't own anything. 
just so we're clear. Image owns zero. Not only is it the best deal in comic books, it is the best deal in entertainment, period. Nobody gives you that deal. So why are we successful now 25 years later? Because we're letting people basically own their own ideas and their properties. That's why we've created a haven for them. Image comes out the gate. Over the next, say, three or four years, there's a splintering and the yep. levels of success start to become stratified. What is going on internally during that? Okay, so, here, so here's what it is. So you now have seven personalities wired seven different ways and they all have to deal with this giant success in any way they see fit. So what happened? Some people folded. Some people sort of went in the field position. Some people tried to expand too quick. And again, remember, we, we were trying to learn how to be businessmen. And now you're going, <gasps> so how does this all work? I am telling you, we took kids who were making 30 grand and they do a book for us and we we're handing them a check on their first book, half a million dollars, right? Again, over 15 years worth of income for one book. For one issue or one? One, one issue. And then, couldn't get them on the phone. Why? They're in the Bahamas. They've got a bicycle. They've got a motorbike. They're like, what are you talking about? They just got 15 years of income. They're 23 years old and they're off to the races. And we don't have any power in our system to tell them to get back to the drawing board and write and draw and get the comic books out. We don't have that power. Why? Because we don't have any ownership. And Hollywood was coming. Why? Because we now owned our own, own IPs. And since we own our own IPs, people now had to come to us. And so now we were taking meetings and stuff. And every time you take a meeting, that's hours away from the board. Drawing comics is incredibly physically taxing. And you're now making millions of dollars per month as an artist. Is it hard for you to sort of keep yourself in that zone of like, I'm gonna go spend 10 hours a day by myself working what drove me was I knew that for longevity, to have any kind of meaningful impact beyond just the first year, or the second year, there was gonna there was gonna have to be some sustainability. So I, for me, I, I I made a pact with myself. I said I'm not gonna do any other book other than Spawn for at least 50 issues. I'm not gonna think about doing a, a, a mini series, a spinoff character. Any I want to establish Spawn for 50 issues, get them cemented into the psyche of uh, Americana comic book buyers, and then I'll worry about the other one. In its simplest form, it's just the three little pig story. You can build it out of straw, out of wood, or out of bricks. And it's harder to build it out of bricks and it takes a little bit longer, but it will sustain itself a lot longer. I was just the pig building the brick house. When we draw, we draw on 10 by 15 pieces of paper with a little bit of border. This gray was because it had the lettering on it, so that's why you even have like the oh, tape. That, that's an acetate or like an overlay. That's kind of exactly thing. it. Here's you know me putting a note saying make sure that the color's right or whatever it is. Blah blah blah. You have to draw debris. You have to put doors. There's a lot of boring stuff you have to draw that most people you know don't really pay attention to because they want they want the big sexy page, right? One of the things about Spawn that I think is arguably one of the most interesting is that he's an African-American character. In the history of comics, there are not very many African-American characters that have sold, particularly in that period in the you know, early 90s, that were selling on the level that you were selling, say, Spider-Man or Jim was selling X-Men, right? Right. At, at any point, did that cross your mind as potentially a gamble in and of itself? No, maybe in hindsight it should have, but it, it wasn't. And here was, the, here was the thinking and the rationale to it. Spider-Man's uh, dressed from head to toe. Yet we always talked to him and we always spoke to him and we always wrote the stories assuming he was a white dude. Why? He's covered from head to toe. I don't see one ounce of flesh. So Spawn was always clothed from head to toe. I just wanted to make him a hero who just happened to be a minority. And could I sell that to white people? And I had those days where I was at conventions. I'm sitting in Texas, and I got two good old boys in front of me. And they're going, Todd, that Spawn, he's my favorite hero of all time. And I go, you remember, that's a black man. <gasps> and they catch themselves. Because I took it away so early in the game that they were just like, oh, he's cool. His costume's cool. He does cool stuff. He's kind of heroic. Go on, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, I forgot. And by the way, if you, if who's Spawn? He's essentially Todd. He's me. <laughs> if, I, if I got hit by a bolt of lightning, what would I do? 
Uh, I'd come back for the love of my life. It's no accident that the person in the comic book is Wanda. That's the name of my wife, right? And the things that he was doing in the first five, six issues, it wasn't an accident that he killed the Billy Kincaid, the pedophile. You push me far enough, I'd do the same thing. If Batman can't stop him enough times, if the system can't stop him enough times, if after 10 escapes, the pedophile's still on the street, I bet you me and two other dads will just pay that guy a visit and he may disappear someplace. Because if the system can't stop that guy from hurting the children, I will stop him from hurting the children. Done. Despite all his success, even McFarlane's outsized talent couldn't supersede the implosion of the comic book market. So rather than go down with the ship, he diversified his bonds, bringing Spawn to Hollywood and launching McFarlane Toys. So this is the prototype, and this is actually what came out of the package. Oh, wow. Right? So as you can see, and the reason we would sculpt this size, which is why you've got all these big ones in here, yep. is because the bigger something is, the more dexterity you have with the clay. We would take both of these versions to the toy fair and say, our prototype will look like our finished product. Because other companies would say that, but they wouldn't deliver. When I first started, I went, sure, sure, young man. Mm -hmm. And I had to actually start it showing to them. At the outset of Image, the entire industry is in its zenith. It's a boom, right. unlike anything that the comic industry had ever seen. During the course of the 90s, though, that ebbs dramatically. How does that affect your business? It's not an accident that I started a toy company and that I started doing some more stuff in Hollywood and I started branching out in other places because the thought was, if the comic industry wanted to self-implode, and wanted to commit sort of business suicide, then, then I, was gonna, I was gonna create a plan that was gonna at least insulate me somewhat so that I could survive this. Because I wasn't gonna go down with this ship. I started other corporations and I started other businesses spreading the brand, spreading the artwork, spreading my ideas so that, again, the chances of all those different areas going down at the same time was highly unlikely. What was the moment that you looked at the, the toy industry and said, I can be disruptive in this industry just like I was in comics? Um, it was this simple. I walked down the aisles of action figures and I went, I don't get why they can't look cooler. And so at some point, I went, hey, you know what? I want to make Spawn toys. I couldn't make a deal and all the, you know, Hasbro's and Mattel's and, Jacks and whoever it was, they all came and, and wanted the Spawn toys. And, I, and, they, and I, I didn't sell to them. Why? Because I go, guys, here's what I think. I've got a non-traditional character. I think we need to make non-traditional sculpts and we need to sell it in non-traditional places. And they couldn't get their head wrapped around it. They're a billion dollar model. So they're going, little boy, we know how to make this work. We make billions. They were gonna put me next to Disney product in the same stores, selling it the same way was gonna be a failure because it wouldn't resonate with, this, with, with that buying crowd. It was gonna, we were gonna have to do something different. And then when it didn't work, they were gonna hand me my brand back and it was gonna be broken. So I said, no, I'll just start, I'll start my own toy company then. So all of a sudden I come along, I put some cool arty toys out and it was a shock to the system. And they're going, what? And I remember they're going, Hasbro people were going, you can't make that toy and sell it for a dollar more and sell, who's gonna buy, toys are $5.99, Todd. You can't sell a $6.99 toy. Of course you can. Here's how you do it. You give them $6.99 worth of value. That simple. The price wasn't relevant. They just were in their little mindset. So it gave a break for me. So I started doing stuff and we start winning awards. Doing lots of detail. Anybody could have painted their toys like I did. There was nothing that prevented any company for the last 50 years prior to my entry that stopped anybody from painting them, sculpting them, or designing them the same way. And then we won dozens of awards on our sports figures. As they're handing me the award, they're going, Todd, this is because you make the greatest sports figures of all time, and this is great. What is your secret? How do you make them so real? And I give them the answer, and I will give you the secret. We use a technology, if you can't understand what I'm about to say, you can go to Google and you can look it up. It's called a camera. And if you take a camera and you push a button, it gives you a photo. And if you take the photo and you don't stop manipulating your clay till it looks exactly like the photo, it looks exactly like it. So <laughs> the question is not, how did you make it look like the photo? 
The question is, how did they not? For decades, we were using photo reference. You're a genius. We're going to give you awards. Oh my gosh. And I'm going, wow, really? All I've done is just made stuff that already exists look sexier. I've never invented anything. So why didn't anybody else do it? I don't know. Go ask them. So when you start McFarland Toys, um, do you put up all the money yourself? Sure. Was that a big gamble relative no. to your personal fortune at that point? No. Anybody who ever tells you don't spend your own money is somebody who's never spent their own money. I'm going to tell you the opposite. Always spend your own money because then nobody gets to tell you a single damn thing. If it fails, then I go back and I'm kind of making 80000 I'm back to my red line again. Right? You're, you're under the, the, the precept that all of this matters. <laughs> right? It only matters so I can bring the art. This is why I can never lose a negotiation because they can never take anything of value from me. There's only a couple things that have value to me. My wife and my kids. And nobody's ever threatened any of them in a negotiation. They've threatened to take away contracts and money and market shares and licenses. Ouch. Wow. I can replicate all those in 10 seconds. I don't care. So was it a risk? No. Because at some point you go, nobody's making cool toys. I guess I'll just have to go and see how hard it is. How quickly did that business take off? I, I go talk to business people, the young kids at, at business school, and I go, besides some tenacity and hard work and all those other things you've heard, dumb luck must be a semi-regular friend, right? You must have a little bit of dumb luck. So let's, let's go to the dumb luck moment. I go to, to New York Toy Fair. This is where you go and you show all your toys and somebody comes in and they decide where they're gonna buy your toy. Mattel has an entire building 12 stories high. Hasbro has an entire building 14 stories high. It's, it's massive. I'm in a building that's 10 stories high. On one floor, in one room, there's 20 of us. My space was five feet by five feet. And there was somebody, I was like a, being at a swap meet. Right? There was somebody next to me here, next to me here, next to me here. I didn't even have a prototype. This is how dumb I was. I didn't even have a prototype. I had drawings that I cut out and I put in packaging and I had them up there, right? And then the moment, my first toy fair, the door opens up and the buyer from Toys R Us comes in. Now remember, we're going back to 1994. At that point, Toys R Us was the biggest toy buyer. Walmart was soon to crush them, but not at that moment. Toys R Us was the god. The Toys R Us buyer opens the door whoosh, and there's a hush. And he steps in with his little young aide standing next to him and everybody in the five by fives stands up to attention, just like the, the general came into the army barracks. And I'm looking going, what, who's that? They're going, oh, that's the Toys R Us buyer. I'm going, oh, okay, cool. And he walks, dook, 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 dook. and as he walks, if he doesn't stop at your booth, he's not buying your stuff. As he walked by them, they were going, oh, do, oh, do, oh, do. And I'm going, oh, I could just see the, the depression as he walked by. And they walk and they walk, and he stops in front of my booth. And did he love my stuff? Of course he didn't. He didn't even know who the hell I was. Here's the dumb luck. His assistant, who was 21, who was a Image Comics fan, sits there and goes, boss, this is the guy I was talking to you about. He's coming out with toys with this thing that's at the top of the charts, blah, 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 blah. And the buyer looked at me and went, what's the price? I told him, can you get it out by this date? Of course I can. I didn't have no idea. Of course I can, right? Always say yes to any answer, right? And worry about figuring it out later. Of course I can. And he goes, good, you do that. I'll put it in all my stores. I'll go store wide with you. Yes, sir. And we delivered. We delivered it. It sold and whatever else. So but I got store wide. I got store wide at the biggest one with a cardboard cutout. Right? It usually doesn't work that way. So a little bit of dumb luck. But the dumb luck comes because of the body of work and the success I had at those other ventures. So that's where the success matters because the prior success allowed that kid with a straight face to say to his boss, "You should look at this. These three." are the top three home run balls in Major League history right here. 66, 70, 73. The reason I bought it, I was trying to get into the sports toys. They wouldn't let me come in. They're going, who the hell are you? It was my auntie into the game. They gave, they gave me a meeting. They go, oh, he loves sports. He spent a lot of money, must be successful. He's got toys, bring them in. 
and they went, you want to do sports? Yeah, it looks like you're successful, boom. And so I've said to people, you spend $3 million on a ball, but over the course of 20 years, you make $30 million selling sports toys, you back out your three, you're still up. So two or three years into Image, the entire industry starts to, to wane a little bit. You start to diversify your portfolio. You start the, the toy business. The other big thing that you do is start stepping into Hollywood um, and pretty much simultaneously co-develop the Spawn uh, cartoon with HBO yeah, right, that's the, and, and, the, that's and the live action. Right. Take me through that process. Okay, so so here was, here was the thought process. I create a brand, the brand becomes Spawn, right? So Spawn just becomes the, the, the beginning of it. He becomes the, the start of a foundation. I now need pillars on the foundation. And the pillars to me were toys, video games, TVs, movies. If I could, if I could somehow find those four pillars, you can stack a skyscraper on a good foundation. And so I started, I, I couldn't find anybody to do what I wanted with the toys, I started that. Uh, the video games, we started making video games, I made those deals. And then we ended up making the deal for New Line Cinema for the live action, and very quickly did the animation at HBO that lasted the three years. So I was able to quickly go boom, 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 boom. Now, how, I'm, you know, I'm not smarter than anybody else, the book was selling. And when people now in these places were looking at sales charts, they were seeing some of these image books, mine specifically, spawn ahead of characters like Spider-Man and Batman and Captain America and Superman. So they were making these sort of evaluations, oh, it must be bigger and more popular than Superman. Not really, because it's sort of brand new and you don't really know what it is. But if you want to come and make an offer and, and help me plant one of these foundations, then God bless you, and I was able to do that. So with the toys, you were incredibly hands-on. You took it, no one could match the kind of quality that you were looking for for your brand, so you, so you took it on I yourself. I own that, I own that. But with the movies and the TV, right. you had to partner with other people. How right. was that? It was okay, because again, look at everything you do, you just go through the, the sort of the pros and cons of all of it, right? And there's everything from, I'm gonna do it all myself, spend all my own money and, and, and to heck with everybody, to I'm gonna give it away and I'm gonna let somebody do it and I don't have any input and then everything in between. Can I put myself in a position, i.e., let's say the HBO animation, that the deal was, I'm in charge, you know, but I've never done any animation, but that's the deal, right? And so they basically let a newbie animator be in charge of the animation of it. Okay, if you, if you let me do that, I'll surround myself with good people and we'll just figure this thing out because I'm gonna have 400 years of experience around me and they're just gonna teach me and I'm a quick study, right? I just, I'll pick it up on the fly. Uh, but I, at the end of the day, I get to make some of the creative decisions, not just everybody up in the executive suite. So how are you splitting your time at this point between all of these different endeavors? Even though I limited myself on being distracted by the number of books I was doing, I still was getting distracted by trying to put those foundations. And I was trying as good as I, I could to put out image, but I wasn't doing it on quite as steady a monthly process as I should have uh, relative to what I was doing at that point on Spider-Man. Um, in, the, in the toy business, just trying to figure out that you can't mess around with deadlines because when you promise toys to big companies like Walmart and, and Toys R Us and Kmart back then and, and uh, Target and these types of stores, you get punished if, if you don't deliver product. Why? Because they've cleared space and a shelf for you. And if there's no product, they're losing money. So you can't, you can't not do what you sort of set out to do. So I, I, I got punished in a couple of these things uh, and, and went, wow. And once, once, you get, once, you, once you feel pain or you, you get close to seeing some of these businesses maybe start to wobble, it, 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 it sobers you up very quickly. In hindsight, time, time should teach you something. And what time should teach you is where, where, where the mistakes and the potholes are. Over time, I found out I'm a five ball juggler. And what that means is every juggler has a max number. And if I don't care if, if you've seen these guys on stage in Vegas, they can juggle 20 balls. Even them, they have a max number. And if you throw one more ball than they can handle, guess what happens? Every ball falls to the ground. So over time, I thought I could juggle more than I could and they started falling and I paid the price on everything. Any new opportunity comes, I must put one of the balls down. 
and then bring in the new opportunity. So I'm, I never go beyond five. The animated series with HBO was very well received and, in, you know, in many circles seen as ahead of its time. Um, the live action film, less so. Yeah. Um, it was critically sort of panned and I know it made some money. Yeah. You know, when you look back on that, where do you feel like it went wrong? The li- I'd call the live action a double, right? Obviously it was far from a home run. It wasn't a failure. I mean, it made money, it did whatever. Uh, we had a, a, a first-time producer, first-time director, first-time special effects guy. It was the first movie I was made. So you had a bunch of, 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 of first-time people on a movie trying to do the best that we could. Um, I, I thought that we tried to do too much and put too much in it, and we ran out of time on it. And so there's still parts in there that make me queasy because they look unfinished to me. Uh, from a story point of view, I didn't have that much impact in, on, on the story. I, I wouldn't have put a boy and a dog in it. I, just, I think that, that makes it juvenile. I think the reason that the HBO worked a lot better was we just went straight into R, and we just went, even though it's animation, I don't know if you remember, but it had every single disclaimer that there was. Mm-hmm. I, there was I think there was only five or something. We had all five. We were the first show to have all five. As an animated show, I was quite proud. Um, because we just say, I just go, we're gonna, and I had way more impact on that show with HBO, that we were gonna go into this mature, sophisticated, dark area. And I think Spawn lives better in that place. I don't think Spawn, especially now that he's 25 years old, I don't think Spawn lives in PG-13 land. I, I, it's, I've, I've said over and over and over when the next movie comes out, which it's coming, uh, it's gonna be a dark R going to be a dark R-rated movie because it just it's not a superhero, you know, spandex type story that I'm trying to tell. You took on Spider-Man at issue 298. At that point, he was the most blue chip legacy brand in the Marvel empire. Spawn is about to reach issue 300, which will tie the longest running independent comic in history. Right. And there's a young artist who's probably helping you on pencils now for whom Spawn means to them what Spider-Man, Spider-Man meant, meant to, to me, you. right, yes. Do you, do you contemplate that ever? It's, it's uh, at times, and it's a weird thing. I remember buying my first Spider-Man issue, was issue 167, and then I was like, wow, I thought it had been around forever. Since Spawn's 25 years old now, you know, he's been published for 25 years, that there's somebody that's 24 who's never lived in this country and in a world that doesn't have Spawn in it. It's odd when you think about it intellectually, but mm-hmm. given that you're still in the middle of the race, every day is just, nobody does me any favors. I, I just have to sort of work hard. You don't really think about it. You know, maybe someday I'll write my memoirs and I'll go, hey, I guess we made a mark. But I, you know what? I still think I got 30 more years to make the mark. But you still write every issue yes. of Spawn to yeah. this day. Sure, I'm still one of the better artists at my company. Yep. I'm sure that there are points where you're like running around, going to Hollywood, checking on here's the what, here's, here's, I know your question. You, you here's, could here's hire what, someone to do that. Dude, here's what drives me. My goal in life is to outlast every one of my enemies. That will be the sweet revenge that I get. At this point in my career, after 30 years, I'm okay. I don't need to chase the money. So now I can just be fearless. What gives you sort of more personal satisfaction at this point. Here's the nirvana, right? I'm I'm, I'm 56 years old, so I'll give you my, the the 56-year-old nirvana right here. It's finding the space, doing it your way, and it works. And you go, wow, I actually got to have fun, and they're gonna pay me for it. It's a good day. And I've been able to play that trick now for decades. It's a good day. They're going to pay you to have fun and do whatever it is that you come up with. I don't get to have a bad day. Because whenever I have a bad day, I always have to ask the same question. Who started it? Uh, duh, that's that guy I shave with every day. That's me. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, I don't get to bellyache to anybody. I'm going cool. I'm willing to go into these marketplaces because if it doesn't work, I don't care. I don't have shareholders. I don't have to maximize profits every 90 days. I can just do crazy stuff, and sometimes the crazy works. Every day that I don't have to work for a corporation is a moral victory for me. And I've been doing it now for 30 years. And now, I'll quit. I'll retire before I go back. So I'll never, I'll never go back, and I'll, I'll, I'll quit a free man. So what started as 
me in a room by myself for 12 hours a day is now expanded to me employing anywhere between 100 and 200 people at any time. And I'm smart enough to find brilliant people that have skills that I don't have that make me look good every single day. And even though I'm 56 years old, I feel like I'm 10. I feel like I'm 12. I'm young again. I've got the enthusiasm. I like today's a good day. I'm not letting adults get to me. When I've met people like Steven Spielberg or, or James Cameron or these types, that when you get them away, they, they turn into 12-year-old boys. I think it's the reason for their success, that they still have a boyish wonder buried inside that they've never, ever, ever lost. And we try as adults to basically lose that childishness out of it. Something to be said about immaturity.